Well, hello. It is so good, so good to be with you. Greetings from Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is colder than Monterey Peninsula. It is so good to be here. Uh, but while Chris and I have made our home in uh, Grand Rapids in Michigan for decades now, we actually met in high school in Sacramento, California, where I moved in order to start my sophomore year of high school. And the way I ended up in Sacramento was really a story of uh, massive upheaval. Uh, have you ever had uh, like a day that tipped your life upside down? Uh, a day so disruptive that you could mark everything before that day and after that day? Uh, my day of upheaval was a November morning of my seventh grade year when I awakened to learn that my mom had been killed in an automobile accident the night before. My father was a small church pastor in southeastern Idaho, he had five children. My sister was 13, I was 12. My younger brothers were nine, four, and two months old. And the two-month-old little brother uh, lived through the accident that took my mom's life. And everything changed for us in, a, in an instant. Uh, months after my mom's death, my dad announced that we were going to be moving to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we moved to Grand Rapids to start my eighth grade year. And in Grand Rapids, he quickly met and married a 21-year-old recent college graduate, which was a little interesting for all of us. Uh, now, Carolyn, my stepmom, she is one of the most gracious people you would ever meet, but it just doesn't take a lot of imagination realizing 21-year-old stepmom now with five kids. He really should have told her about us before the wedding. Uh, it wasn't like someone was replacing my mom. It was like I now had an older sister with a lot of authority. So two years in Grand Rapids, and then my dad announced that we were moving to California. So I started my sophomore year in Sacramento. It's like my early childhood years, this town in Idaho that I was accustomed to, everything was stable, everything was safe, everything was known. One funeral, one wedding, and two cross-country moves later, everything had been flipped upside down and then flipped upside down again. And if I had to pick two words that I experienced when starting my sophomore year, those two words would be alone and afraid. Alone and afraid. Now, not afraid as in panicked, but afraid as in new state, new school, no friends, here we go again walking into a new school and not knowing anything or anybody. And I think even now as I talk about my seventh grade year and sophomore year in high school, I'm looking at some of you and you're just going like, Jeff, I know days like that. It was a day for you when someone said, I don't love you anymore, I'm not sure I ever did, and the marriage was over. The phone call that came that said, there's, there's been an accident you better get down to the hospital fast. The Monday morning that you walked into an office building to discover that your entire department had been erased, canceled, and you were suddenly unemployed. A day of chaos where suddenly you felt alone and afraid. And this, this sensation, this feeling of being alone and afraid, is, it's exactly where we find our main character today. His name is Jacob. And Jacob's story is found very early in the Bible. And when we check in on Jacob today, you need to know something. He is a man on the run. If Jacob comes go moving through your village, he looks like a guy in a hurry, and he is. He's trying to put as many miles behind him as he can. He's moving as fast as he can and as far as he can because that dude had ripped somebody off, and he's running for his life. And as we open the scriptures and we see Jacob today, literally, he reaches this point where he just crashes and he puts his head on a stone for a pillow, probably curls up with his coat for a blanket. So here he is, coat for a blanket, stone for a pillow, alone and afraid. And as he crashes that night in a place called Bethel, I, I don't think he has any clue that that very space where he feels lost, alone, and afraid is the exact space where God will meet him, where something will get ignited, restarted, and renewed, and really where his journey toward God will begin. 
There's a map here. It shows a place called Beersheba in the south and Haran in the north. He's traveled from Beersheba up to Bethel. Now Jacob left Beersheba and set off for Haran. By my math, that's about 600 miles. He's moving fast because somebody's after him. And what I hope you experience today as we walk through this story today, if you just get one thing, I would just for you, love for you to gain hope that that very space where you feel lost, alone, and afraid is the very space where God may be interested in meeting you, being with you, and calling you in a brand new way. So the story about Jacob, it really unfolds in three parts for us today. In part one, part one, I'm just calling the blessing. Part one, the blessing. Because you really can't get to know Jacob without knowing something about his grandpa. Jacob's grandpa appears pages into the beginning of our Bible. Guy's name is Abraham. Abraham is Jacob's grandpa. And God comes to this guy by the name of Abraham and asks him to go on this epic migration. It's like, leave, Abraham, just move, leave, trust me, leave your family, leave your people, leave everything that's familiar, and I will bless you unimaginably. Abraham, I will bless you and I will bless your life. I'll bless you with offspring. At the time, Abraham's married to his wife is Sarah. They've got no kids and they're not young. I'll bless you with offspring. Abraham, I'll bless you with land, with property. It's the land of promise, the promised land, Canaan. And Abraham, this blessing that I'm gonna give to you is to cascade from you to the rest of the world. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so it's just this story of blessing. Abraham, blessed with children, offspring, blessed with property, cascading blessing to other people. And Abraham grows old, and before he dies, he reaches out his hands, and he transfers the blessing to his son, Isaac, before he dies. Now, Isaac is old. Isaac is old. He is blind, but before he dies, it's time for him to stretch out his hand and to transfer the blessing to his son, Esau. From Abraham to Isaac to Esau. This is the way the story goes. Isaac, old and blind, he calls in Esau. Esau's a hairy hunter. And he says, Esau, get your bow, get your arrows, go out into the wild, shoot some wild game, haul it back home, cook me that wonderful venison stew that I love, and after I eat the stew, after I eat the soup, I will bless you. Esau grabs his bow and arrows, hauls out to the countryside, and meanwhile, Isaac's wife, her name is Rebecca, she had a favorite son, and it wasn't Esau. It was Esau's younger brother, Jacob. And she calls Jacob and says, quick, 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 run out to the goat pen, grab two young goats. I'm gonna kill them, make a stew. You take the stew, you bring it to your father. He's blind, he's gonna think you're Esau. After he eats the stew, he will put the blessing on you. This is in your Bible. And Jacob goes, uh, we got a few problems here. Number one, I don't sound like Esau. Number two, I mean, he spends all his time out hunting. I don't smell like Esau. And Esau is this hairy man. I, if dad touches me, I don't feel like Esau. And his mom says, don't worry, they kill the goats. She takes goat hair, puts it on his arms and hands and on the back of the neck so that if Father Isaac pulls him in for the blessing, he'll feel hairy like Esau does. And so Jacob takes this food and he he brings it into his father and he goes, Father, Father, I am Esau. I have your stew. And literally Esau says, so soon? And Jacob says, the Lord gave me success in the hunt. You liar. You liar. The Lord gave me success. And Isaac, the blind father, says, it doesn't sound quite like Esau. Come closer to me. And Jacob comes closer. Smells like Esau. He's wearing Esau's hunting clothes. 
And then he says, come in, come in closer. And he puts his hand on his arms on the back of his neck. Jacob delivers the stew. Isaac eats it and he reaches out his hands and the blessing that he wanted to give to Esau, he gives to the younger son, Jacob. Can you think of anyone that's gonna be upset when they get home? Esau gets home, he makes the stew, he brings it in. Here I am, father, waiting for the blessing. And Isaac goes, I already gave it to somebody else. Esau has a meltdown, he is livid, he is enraged. But suddenly he's kind of looking peaceful and joyful because he has come up with a plan. The day my dad dies, I'm gonna kill him. I'll kill Jacob and let's see what happens to the blessing then. Mom pulls her favored son aside and said, uh, I think it would be good if you left town for a while. Go up north to where our, my relatives live, 600 miles away up to Haran. Look up your uncle, my brother, by the name of Laban. And that's, that's, what J- that's why we find him with his coat for a blanket and a rock for a pillow. He's running for his life. And as Jacob lays down, I think like three days into his journey, I think this man has some questions as he falls asleep. Number one, I'm moving fast, but what if Esau's moving faster? Now, I don't think Esau's chasing him, but Jacob doesn't know that. He's got like his walking stick, a little bag with some food. What if I run out of food? What if I starve to death out here? And when I get up north, how am I going to locate these distant relatives? What if they aren't even alive anymore? Am I ever going to make it back here, back home? These are the questions that might be on Jacob's mind as he drifts off to sleep. So let me ask you a question before we move on in the story. You ever make a mess of things? You ever look back on an event in your life and you go, I wish I had a do-over on that one. You ever wish you had a do-over on that semester at that college? You ever wish you had a do-over with that relationship? Uh, The text, the text went out, the text went around, and the text came back. Ever wish you had a do-over on something that you said? You ever make a mess of things that you ever wish you had a do-over? Listen, as Jacob drifts off to sleep, I don't think he has any clue. I don't think he has any idea that that very space where he feels lost, alone, and afraid is the very space that God will choose to meet him and call to him and ignite something in him and launch his journey of trust. Part one of the story, the blessing. Part two of the story, the dream. Jacob drifts off to sleep. And here's the dream. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway. A stairway was resting on the earth, but uh, which had its top reaching to heaven. And there's angels. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Two important words. The angels of God were, help me here, they were ascending and they were what? They were descending on this staircase. Now, remember the ascending and descending on the staircase, the angels of God. And there above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I am grandpa's God. The God who called him and the God who led him. I am your dad's God. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you were lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth in number. All peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Do these promises sound familiar to you, vaguely familiar? These were the same promises two generations before that had been given to Grandpa, Abraham, Jacob, I intend to bless you. I intend to bless you by giving you this land. I intend to bless you with offspring. And just like with grandpa, I intend for this blessing to cascade from your life into the others, that that all people. 
Now, if I'm Jacob and I'm getting this dream, it's kind of like, yeah, but... But what if Esau catches me and kills me? And what if I run out of food and starve? And what if I get up north and I can't even find these long-lost relatives? And am I ever going to make it back here? And then you have these four promises that the Lord gives. Look at these four statements with me. I am with you. I will watch over you. I will bring you back. I will not leave you. Read this out loud with me if you can. Ready? I am with you. I will watch over you. I will bring you back. I will not leave you. What if you need to hear one of those statements for your life today? What if you needed the Lord your God just to whisper into your life, I'm with you? It might seem like I'm far, but I'm with you. I'm watching over you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm with you. I'm with you. This is what Jacob hears and sees in this dream. Does this trouble you? Who are these promises made to? A crook on the run. Jacob is a con. He lied to his dad, he ripped off his brother, and here is the Lord saying, I will bless you, I am with you. I think God needs to pick better company. (laughs) Why in the world would the Lord make these promises to Jacob of all people? The guy's a crook. The answer is because it's not just about Jacob. Remember the promises that were given to Abraham and now transmitted to Jacob. I will bless you with offspring. I will bless you with territory, property. But through you, all the world would be blessed. Two words, two words, all peoples. Two words, all peoples. Jacob, all peoples of the world will be blessed through you, my friends. This isn't just about Jacob. So I'd love for you to say four words out loud with me. The words are not just about me. Ready? Play along, please. Not just about me. Whisper it now. Ready? Ready? Not just about me. Do you realize what I'm trying to say here? That when God meets you in a place of difficulty and when he ignites something and when he begins something new and when he calls your name in a fresh way, it's not just about me. It's not just about you. Remember that. Your spiritual growth isn't just about you. It's intended to cascade into the lives of people around you, not just about me. So think about uh, three houses in a neighborhood, uh, three houses side by side, and you live in the house on the left. Now listen, if our gracious God is pleased to bring any health and healing into your household, whatever it is your household looks like, just remember something, it's not just about you. He might be interested in the house two doors down. It's not just about you. He may bring you health and healing to your home so that that can cascade into the lives of others, not just about me, not just about me. The work that he may be doing in your life might be intended to cascade into the lives of others. Think of a work environment. Let's just say you're part of the work team in the foreground there. And two years ago, it was just nasty, difficult, hard, upheaval. But, but, but then you begin to invite God into each and every day. He begins to give you joy at work. He begins to give you a greater level of patience for other people. And there's just this moment where you go, I am so thankful for this newfound joy that I have in my work. Just remember, not just about you. It might be about that guy up in the corner that God desires to meet him because of your growth. My friends, this is so important in relationship to family. Even if right now you are unattached and there are no prospects on the horizon because you go, hey man, why should I work on my spiritual growth? It's just me. God may be cultivating your life today to touch your grandchildren yet unborn and unimagined. And right now, you're not even seeing anybody. 
cultivate, develop, mature now for the relationships that will come later. Jacob, a crook. And God gives these promises, I'm with you, because it's not just about Jacob. God desires to bless others. When this guy gets off the dime, when this guy gets moving, when his journey of trust begins. Now, if you're Jacob and you've got a coat for a blanket and a stone for a pillow and you have this dream, how do you react to that when you wake up? Part one of the story, the blessing. Part two of the story, the dream. Part three of the story, the stone. Part three of the story, the stone. We read these words, verse 17 of Genesis 28. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? No kidding. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Jacob goes, God was in this place, and I didn't even know it. I just found the door to the other world. See, Jacob believes that he has camped out at the portal, the gateway, the door to the other world. Oh, this is the place where the angels of God descend and ascend, like they bring messages down. I didn't even know it, but the place where I put my head is the portal to the other world. Now, back in the day, if you thought you had discovered a sacred space where the gods visited human beings, baby, you'd do something. If you had the resources and if you had the time, what you would do on that very space, you would build a temple and not just a small temple. There's a picture here. This is a structure that is in Iraq and it's called, if I'm pronouncing it right, a ziggurat. And this is one of those temples that represent it. Well, you notice the staircase moving from earth up into the heavens. You go, Jeff, that's massive. No, no, it was much bigger than that. That's just the base. Here's a picture of an artist's rendition of what the entire structure would have looked like. Again, notice the staircases moving from the earth up into the heavens so that you could communicate with a god or with the gods. Jacob believes that this is what he has happened upon, a portal, a gate, a door. And it's really interesting to see how Jesus would reference this story centuries later. Let me show you something. Jesus is attracting disciples. Uh, A guy by the name of Andrew starts following Jesus around. He runs and he finds his brother by the name of Peter. Says, you gotta meet this guy. And now it's Andrew and Peter. Philip, Philip starts tagging along with Jesus. He runs and finds his buddy, Nathaniel, and says, Nathaniel, we found him, we found him. We think we found the person who came to be our Messiah, Jesus from Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, what? Nazareth? That's the sticks. Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And then uh, Philip says, okay, okay, come and see. And so Nathaniel brought by Philip to see Jesus. And there's this conversation, this interaction between Jesus and Nathaniel in John chapter one, last verse of John chapter one. I want to show you something Jesus said in this exchange. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God Doing what? Two things. Ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That was a title Jesus had for himself. Any observant Jew in Jesus' day would know what Bible story Jesus is quoting when he told Nathaniel, you will see the heavens open and the angels ascending. Jesus is quoting the Jacob story from Bethel, from Jacob's dream. And what Jesus is saying here is this. He is saying to Nathaniel, I am the portal. I am the gate. I am the door. I am that space where heaven touches earth. 
Nathaniel, don't feel like you have to go to a place to find God. Don't go to a place. Come to me. I am the portal. I am the place where heaven and earth meet. I am the ladder. I am the staircase connecting heaven and earth. It's why Jesus would continually offer invitations to himself. At one point, he would look at the tired, exhausted crowds, and he would say, come to me. Not go to a temple, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How do I qualify? Well, you just have to be really, really tired. (laughs) Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Jesus uses this staircase to describe himself. I am the gate, I am the door, I am the portal, I am heaven come to earth. Jacob, he wakes up the next day and he does something. Early the next morning, early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Jacob, next morning, he wakes up and that that stone that he used for a pillow, he lifts it upright And then he goes to his bag, backpack, whatever he had. He's got some cooking things there. He gets a little bit of oil, and he comes, and he anoints the stone with some oil, marking this as the place where God met him. And then he makes a promise. He says, okay, I'm going north. If Esau doesn't kill me, if I find my distant relatives, and if I ever make it back here again, I'm going to come right back to this space and build an altar here, and then you will be my God. Jacob does not have mature faith here, but he has something very important. He has starter faith. He's got enough faith to get him moving. And here he's just saying, listen, just keep me safe. Bring me back to this place. And it will no longer be the God of grandpa. It will be my God. And he leaves. And he makes it north. And he runs into his uncle, a guy by the name of Laban, who is twice the con that he is. And now Jacob has the wonderful opportunity of discovering what it's like to be across from someone like him. 20 some years later, when he moves back home, he will have 12 sons and four wives, which will have to be discussed on another day. And he's going to have to have a face to face with Esau, the brother that he ripped off over 20 years before. There's a time, seven chapters after this story, I believe it's Genesis chapter 35, where where Jacob grabs all his kids and grandkids, and he says, we're going to go back, we're going to go back to Bethel, I will build an altar to God at the place where God met me, because this is the God who my God has been with me, and he has watched over me, and you discover at that point, probably three decades after the dream that it's no longer just grandpa's God and grandma's God. The God of Abraham has become the God of Jacob. Grandpa's God has become his God. And now it's no longer just starter faith. Now it's a faith of someone who has seen the presence of God over a period of decades. So I've got a, I've got a question for you. Is... Is there a place in your life or a time in your life where you feel that you could like set up a little stone because you say, God met me there. I was lost, I was alone, and I was afraid, and I didn't know what to do. And the very space where I was most confused was a space where God met me and he ignited something and he restarted something and he relaunched something and he renewed something. Can any of you name a place or a time when you felt God met you in your confusion, when you felt lost and alone? Of the various spaces in my life where I would... uh, set up a stone like this to mark 
a meeting place with God, one would be not far from Lake Tahoe, Northern California. The beginning of my sophomore year in high school. One funeral, one wedding, two cross-country moves, new school, new state, no friends, and I became part of a youth group. And before the school year started in this brand new space, we went on a retreat and we went up. I remember the evening we were sitting in an amphitheater not far from Lake Tahoe and the speaker got up to speak and he said, listen, it's probably time for some of you to make a decision. You've been drifting and I had been drifting. And it's just time for you to decide which way you're gonna go and perhaps... This day, you hear the Lord whispering your name and calling your voice, and it's time to respond. And after two years of spiritual drift, since my mom's death and the remarriage and the two moves, it was time for me to just say, I'm back. (laughs) Here I am. Meet me here. I just don't want God to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want him to be my God. And what happened there in that amphitheater wasn't instant movement and total maturity, but it was a start, a fresh start of the journey where something got ignited, something got restored, something got renewed, that's where I would set up one of my stones in life. Where might one of yours be? And is it possible that years from now, some of you would look back and you would go, Jeff, I'll tell you where one of my stones needs to be, March 2022, where things were a little crazy deeply disruptive, I felt lost, alone, and afraid, and God met me through a story of someone else, a guy by the name of Jacob. And at that point where he felt lost and alone was the very space where God met him, and that's the space where God met me. Perhaps today's your day to mark space for God's fresh movement in your life. And where you can say in a new and profound way, I don't want it just to be the God of Abraham. I want him to be my God. And as God meets you, may he work through you and beyond you to bless others through your movement. And so this day, once again, we pray, gracious God, move us, transform us, renew us. Be with us, watch over us. As we move back to you, we ask this in the name of Jesus who came here for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Well, before I send you out with a word of blessing, I want to give you three quick invitations. Number one, uh, if you would like prayer for anything, whether it's a great joy in your life or maybe a real difficult situation that's going on in your life, maybe you're in a difficult season, our prayer teams are down front. They'd love to pray with you if you're here on campus. And also for those of you that are online watching this morning, if you want to call the number that's on your screen and our prayer teams are standing by to pray with you as well. And for the second invitation is if you are new to Shoreline, we're so thankful you're here today. And also, let's say you've been coming to Shoreline for many, many years or even just recently in the recent months. We want a special invitation today for you to go by our Connection Center. They'd love just to welcome you and also just to, if you've got questions about how can I get more connected here at Shoreline Church, they'd love to answer those questions for you there. And for those of you that are at home, if you're new, you can go ahead and text the word welcome to this number on the screen there. And then finally, uh, Jeff is also an author. Jeff has written several books, and we've got those books available for you in the Connection Center for sale today. If you'd like to check out those books in there, I want to invite you to go ahead and do that today. And then the last invitation would be, if you are able, would you please stand and receive the blessing this morning? So as you go from this place, go in the peace and the power and the presence 
of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Go in Jesus' name out into your individual workspaces, into your neighborhoods, and everywhere in between. Amen? God bless you and have a great day.